our speaker this morning is, uh, is a man who has been blessed by Westmont and who uh, has been blessing Westmont. He graduated in 1985 with a degree in chemistry, went on to uh, Stanford, uh, four years later came back with a PhD and joined the faculty uh, in 1990. Uh, he's been named the uh, Outstanding Teacher of the Year in 94, 2001, 2008, out Outstanding Researcher in 1996. So uh, we know Neva, and uh, we're grateful for Neva Tro. Uh, and he's really well known in lots of other places, uh, like 500 uh, colleges and universities around the world that use uh, his chemistry textbook. But we just know him as Neva, and we're grateful for you, Neva. And uh, we're eager to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Let's welcome him in the name of Christ. Good morning and welcome. I especially want to welcome my fellow alumni to chapel today. You have probably noticed some changes around here. We have some new buildings, some new landscaping, some new faculty. Even this gym has gotten a facelift. However, some things about Westmont have not changed. Westmont continues to be a place where committed Christian faith and serious academic work coexist. We believe that these should coexist because in the end, all knowledge is God's knowledge and all work is God's work. And that is what I want to talk with you about this morning. This summer, a giant in Westmont's history passed away. I know that many of us who graduated from Westmont were greatly influenced by this man. His name is Bob Wemberg, and he taught in the philosophy department. I would like to start my talk today by telling you one fact about Bob and repeating one story that Bob used to tell. The fact about Bob is that one of his favorite movies was Chariots of Fire. The main character in that movie, Eric Little, was an Olympic runner who uttered a famous line that Bob himself a runner in high school, was fond of. The line is this, I believe that God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I was lucky enough to count Bob Wemberg as a dear friend, and I learned this about Bob. He felt God's pleasure in nearly everything that he did. Or rather, he did everything in a way that gave God pleasure. I felt this even when I was a student. Bob's classroom was always a place where you felt that you were in the hands of a person who was teaching, not for a paycheck, not to impress his colleagues or his students, not to be promoted to the next rank in the professorate, but to the glory of his maker. That was just the way that Bob was. The story I want to tell you is one that Bob told in my apologetics class one day when I was a student here. It goes something like this. A Christian surgeon was asked by his pastor, an associate pastor, if they could observe one of his surgeries. The surgeon agreed and gave them a date and time of the surgery. When the day came, the pastor and associate pastor took their places in the observation room. They watched as the room was carefully prepared for the surgery. Finally, the patient was rolled in and the surgeon approached the operating table. Before beginning the surgery, the surgeon turned to his pastors and said, gentlemen, this is my cathedral. And he started the operation. The surgeon meant that the operating room was his place of worship. Bob Wember, through that story, was communicating a simple truth. A secular vocation can be sacred and can, in fact, be in the center of one's Christian's life. When I first came to college, I had always been taught that my Christian life consisted of going to church, volunteering for church ministries, praying, and reading the Bible. What I did with the rest of my life was secular and my own business. Bob was telling me that my idea of the Christian life was much too small. I think that Bob was right, and I would like to spend the rest of this talk developing the idea of the so-called secular vocation as sacred. Let me first say that Few of the ideas I will be presenting here are my own. My thinking on this topic has been shaped by a number of authors such as Friedrich Beekner and Dorothy Sayers, as well as my colleagues here at Westmont. Let me define, for the purpose of this talk at least, the difference between a job and a vocation. A job is something you do to make money so that you can do something else when you're not at your job. 
The world is full of people who have spent their lives in jobs in which they find no pleasure, have no intent in doing well, and in which they see no purpose other than making money. Now, I'm not equating the word job with what may appear on the outside to be mundane work. I know some janitors who have more of a sense of vocation than some CEOs. Rather, I'm equating the word jobs with those things that people do, not because they see any inherent value in the work, but only because of the money it pays or the prestige that it provides. Work that is vocation stands in contrast to work that is a job in at least three important ways. First of all, work that is vocation is work that you take pleasure in. That is, you like doing the work. Secondly, work that is vocation is work that you do well. And thirdly, work that is vocation is work that the world needs done. If you are a medical doctor in a third world country and you practice good medicine, you have met conditions two and three. You do the work well, and it certainly needs to be done. If, however, you hate the work and it leaves you sad and miserable most of the time, you have missed condition one, and you may have not found vocation. If you take great pleasure in playing Yahtzee and can beat anyone in sight and decide to make a living out of it, you have met conditions one and two. You take pleasure in the work and you do it well, but you have failed to meet condition three. The world probably does not need a professional Yahtzee player and you have not found vocation. If you like carpentry and the area where you live needs more carpenters, you have met conditions one and three. You take pleasure in the work and it needs to be done. But if, for whatever reason, your tables all wobble and your drawers do not fit right, you failed to meet condition two, and you have probably not found vocation. Frederick Beekner says this of vocation, the place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Dorothy Sayers talks of the integrity of the work, the stipulation that it should be both worth doing and well done. She says, quote, the habit of thinking about work as something one does to make money is so ingrained in us that we can scarcely imagine what a revolutionary change it would be to think about it instead in terms of the work done. To do so would mean taking the attitude of mind we reserve for our unpaid work, our hobbies, our leisure interests, the things we make and do for pleasure, and making that the standard of all of our judgments about things and people." Unquote. She goes on to say that work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. It is or should be the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual, mental, and bodily satisfaction, and the medium in which he offers himself to God." Unquote. Now that is vocation. Vocation is a spiritual thing. If we are to have that kind of attitude towards our work, it must be work that we love. But might not God call us to do work that we hate? He does, after all, call us to deny ourselves. That is, of course, true. But the paradox is that he gives us ourselves back again, more completely ourselves than before. Lewis puts it this way in one of the screw tape letters. Remember that in these letters, Lewis is writing as a senior demon to his nephew, a junior demon. The enemy, since this is a conversation between demons, is God. Here's what the senior demon says about human likes and dislikes. Remember always that he, that is God, really likes the little vermin and sets an absurd value on the distinctiveness of every one of them. When he talks of them losing their selves, he only means abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all of their personality and boasts, I'm afraid sincerely, that when they are wholly his, they are more themselves than ever. Hence, while he is delighted to see them sacrificing even their innocent will to his, he hates to see them drift, drifting away from themselves for any other reason. And we, that is the tempters, should always encourage them to do so. The deepest likings and impulses of any man or woman are the starting point with which the enemy has furnished him or her. In other words, you may initially find 
your vocation to be difficult. And you may find that it causes you to sacrifice other pursuits that you love. But ultimately, if you find vocation, it will be satisfying because it is a fundamental part of who you are. So remember, a job is work you do for money. Life is too short and too precious to waste on a job, at least for the long term. Vocation, on the other hand, is work that A, you take pleasure in, B, you do well, and C, the world needs done. It seems that artists often have the greatest sense of vocation. They are often in love with their work for its own sake, and they will often work with little hope of remuneration. Artists seem to own their work like few other professions that I know. For example, in our living room, well, before our house burnt down, we had a painting by John Carlander. He sold it to us a few years ago. And by the way, Make sure you get up to the Westmont Art Museum and see his exhibit. It's absolutely beautiful. Yet while that painting existed, it was still his painting, his work. Both he and I always referred to it as his painting at our house. And in fact, in the exhibit, you'll see a number of paintings that belong to other people, but they're back here for this exhibit. It's this kind of ownership over work that you find in vocation. It is this kind of ownership over work that is absent in a job. I've often wondered why the sense of vocation is so great in artists, and there is perhaps an answer. People involved in work as vocation have usually found a way to express their own creativity in their work. The need to express creativity, I think, stems from our being made in the image of God, who is, of course, the ultimate creator. When we are involved in work as vocation, we are carrying out our need to be image bearers of God. Four sides here. I do not think that God has one single narrow vocation picked out for us and that our task is to find it. For some reason, God has chosen not to write each of our life stories with his own hand, but has left some room for our hand as well. We can think of our life as a canvas, which is ours to fill. A number of great paintings are possible on that canvas, and perhaps some that are not so great. The filling, however, is our responsibility. What we should not do is expect that the canvas will somehow be filled for us, nor shall we expect that the filling will be easy. It will not. Any of the many great paintings that are possible will require discipline and plain hard work. There is no other way to make a great painting. We have great freedom, but as Spider-Man says, we also have great responsibility. Second, I think the call to vocation is universal, equally strong in both men and women. I often get women students in my office concerned with how they might have a career and a family. I have yet to get the same question from a male student. Why is that? Do the male students not want families? I believe vocation to be a powerful calling. I also believe parenthood to be a powerful calling. Each family unit has to work out how to balance these two columns in their family life. However, men, you should consider more often how to balance the calling of family with the calling of vocation. First of all, being a stay-at-home dad may be part of your vocation. But even if it is not, do not think for a moment that a family will not demand some compromise from your career. It will. If it doesn't, you have missed out on what it means to be a parent. Women you should consider more often how to balance the calling of vocation with the calling of family. Again, being a stay-at-home mom may be part of your vocation, but you may be also called to something else. And be especially wary of potential husbands that are not open to viewing vocation and family as a joint responsibility. In my own life, these two callings have been intense, and it often feels like they pull in opposite directions. The love I feel for my children is the most intense thing I have ever experienced. My ability, or even need, to unconditionally commit all that I am to them surprises me at times. And yet, I leave home and go to work. Why? The obvious reason is financial. My family could not live without my income. But the deeper reasons go beyond finances, and I would probably continue to work even if we were independently wealthy. The reason? I work because it's part of who I am. Part of what it means to be Neva Tro is to be a chemistry professor at Westmont College. If I lost that, I would be losing a big part of myself. 
And that, of course, ties back to my family. I believe I can most fully support them when I am most fully myself. And so I work. Three, if you are to find vocation, you must be very careful to listen to your own voice. What is it that you take pleasure in and do well? The question is not what your parents think you should like, not what society wants you to do, not even what your professors want you to do, but what do you like and do well? You can get yourself in some trouble when you let others pick your vocation for you. Let me give you the example of my brother. Since he was a young man, I remember him wanting to be a police officer. My mom forbade it. My family is from Cuba, and if you know anything about Cuban moms, you know how powerful they are in the family unit. She was a worrier and thought that a life on the street was much too dangerous for one of her sons. So my brother didn't do it. He went to college, like she wanted him to, and dropped out before he finished. He did several odd jobs here and there and ended up managing a bike shop for several years. But for the most part, he was unhappy. Finally, at the age of 30, he decided to pursue his vocation. Without telling my mom, because he knew he would be talked out of it if he did, he became a police officer. My mom eventually found out, took two years. <laughs> she was very angry, but she got over it. And my brother has found vocation. He loves his work, he does it well, and the world needs it done. Fourthly, if you ever meet a Christian who is doing excellent work that she loves, that the world needs done, let her do it. Do not distract her away from her work to do so-called church work or Christian work. Do not convince her that she should really be working in the ch church boutique on Thursday afternoons or that she should be attending more church luncheons. God has, called, God, sorry, God has not called her to serve the church, but to serve him. In her vocation, she is doing just that. There is no line between her vocation and her religion so that she somehow must choose between them. Rather, she is serving God in all that she does. The non-believer can certainly be reached by Christians volunteering at church. However, how much more might he be reached if he finds out that the best teacher at his daughter's school happens to be a Christian, and that that highly recommended accountant is a Christian, and if the first violinist in his city symphony orchestra is a Christian? I'm of course not saying that the secular vocation is the only part of a Christian's life, but it is at least an important part, and may be part of what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. The kind of vocation I'm talking about can be enhanced by education. Education, such as the one you students are receiving here, impacts all three components that we specified earlier. Let's look at the first one. Vocation is work that you take pleasure in. Your courses can help you discover what sorts of things you like doing. If you are to someday take pleasure in your work, you should use these years to discover what your pleasures are and what sort of work you might take pleasure in. You may already think you know what your pleasures are, but there are probably many other pleasures, perhaps deeper ones, than the ones you currently know. Use your courses to discover these. This will not happen by accident, by the way, and you must be intentional. It will be difficult, for example, to take much pleasure in an assignment if it's 2 a.m. and the assignment's due at 8 a.m. Take the time to do your work slowly and to do it well. You may discover some pleasure that you would miss otherwise. Secondly, vocation is work you do well. By doing your work well, beginning now, in your courses, you are on your way to doing your work well in your vocation. Old habits are hard to break, and new ones are difficult to establish. So get into the pattern of doing your work well right now, and it will last your lifetime. Also, those skills that you learn now will make you better at what you do later, so learn them well. Many vocations call for the same basic skills, clear writing, good speaking, sound reasoning, analytical ability, problem solving, sensitivity to people. All of these skills will serve you well in your vocation. 
Take advantage of this time and learn them now. For the third one, vocation is work the world needs done. Your education will inform you to what sort of work the world needs done. You may find out that the world does not need a professional Yahtzee player after all, but has an intense need for something else. While your classes in a liberal arts college will not necessarily train you in professional areas, they will teach you about humanity and its needs. Listen to your courses, to what you are reading, to what you are learning. What are they telling you about the needs of humanity? Which of those needs might you be able to fill? All of your professors are telling you something about the world, about what it means to be human, about what it means to need. It is there every day for the taking, even in your next class, but you must take it. Pay attention, the lesson is important. Then go back to your room and think about it, write about it, talk it over with your friends. Now some of this may sound a bit elitist. Do only those people lucky enough to go to college find vocation? The answer, of course, is no. A college education is not a requirement for vocation. Some years ago, I met a hospital worker. I'm not sure what her official title was. Maybe she didn't even have one. She called herself a scrub woman. This woman loved what she did. She came in every day with a smile on her face and did the dirty work as if the world depended on it. And in many ways, it did. She liked her work. It needed to be done, and she did it well. She had found vocation. So why all this talk of learning and taking your courses seriously? There is work to be done, so why not go out and do it? While a college education is not a requirement for vocation, it has the potential to make your vocation a bigger thing, a thing in which the pleasure is deeper, a thing that takes your particular skills to do well, and a thing that meets more of the world's need. For example, you may find that you like serving soup and soup lines. The world certainly needs that done, and you have the ability to do it well. No education is necessary, and you might feed 50 people a night. However, an education might allow you, like it has allowed one Westmont graduate, Dean Hirsch, who recently retired as the president of World Vision, to feed not just 50 people a night, but 5 million. Your education will make your vocation a bigger thing. Let me finish by telling you about a student who was in my very first class that I taught in my very first day as a professor at Westmont 20 years ago. She was a hardworking, diligent student who carried her curiosity and passion for learning not just into her major courses in chemistry, which of course are easy to be passionate about, but into every, uh, every single course she took. Today she's a medical doctor. The skills and sensitivities that she developed here, because she was paying attention, have carried over into her vocation. First of all, she is an excellent physician, not only technically competent, but able to deal with people as whole beings and treat them with sensitivity and respect. She can communicate well with both her colleagues and her patients. She has developed an interest in medical ethics and has served on the ethics board in her hospital, helping people make very difficult and complex decisions about life and death. She is particularly interested in women's health issues and volunteers at a women's public health clinic where, among other things, she counsels young women, women who are struggling with unwanted pregnancies. I don't think she has any simple answers for the problems she deals with. She has learned that life is messy. This alum has found her vocation, and a rather biggish one, too. She takes pleasure in her work. The world needs it done, and she does it well. Very well, actually. It's a powerful combination. My prayer for all of you is that you may also find vocation, that place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Thank you. <laughs>